From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 57, recorded on March 10th, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Hello again, Paul. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the chase on important health topics. And boy, do we have important health topics these days. Today, we're going to take a closer look at Paul's column called RFK Jr. and the Texas Measles Outbreak Round 2. So remind us, Paul, what were RFK's initial reactions to the measles outbreak and the death of a child in Texas? Right, so around February 27th, when there were about 124 cases in West Texas and one death um, in a six-year-old girl, his response at a White House meeting with Donald Trump sitting across for him was, you know, um, the measles outbreaks happen all the time. This is nothing unusual. There have been four measles outbreaks this year in this country. Last year, there were 16. So it's not unusual. We have measles outbreaks every year. Well, what was unusual was a death. That was the first death of a child in this country since, for measles since 2003. And secondly, we eliminated measles by the year 2000. Um, it's come back in large part because a critical percentage of parents are chosen not to vaccinate their children. And one of the reasons they make that choice is that they're scared of vaccines or scared of vaccine safety. And one of the people who continually promotes the fact that you should be scared of vaccines is RFK Jr. So when he sort of glibly dismiss this notion that, well, there's nothing to see here, this is just a normal outbreak, people were angry. The public health community was angry. So later, he responded. Why did he write this opinion piece then on Fox News? Because I think he was, uh, he got blowback from people that, that mm -hmm. his dismissal of this as nothing to see here, no big deal, uh, angered people. So in the, in the, in the Fox News op-ed, it started off strong. He said things like, you know, that, that, um, this is a serious disease, um, that vaccines can prevent it. And he went even a step further and said that community immunity is important. In other words, that you have to have a certain percentage of the population around you that is immune if you're to be protected, recognizing that not everybody can mm -hmm. be vaccinated successfully because they're getting cancer chemotherapy or other immune suppressive therapy for rheumatologic or autoimmune diseases. That was all very reasonable uh, and something that he never normally says. And so initially when you read those first two paragraphs of his op-ed, you thought, He's a changed man until you read on. <laughs> so he said, he has said before, no vaccine is beneficial. He has said measles, mumps, rubella vaccine causes autism. So does the Fox statement acknowledge that his previous statements are lies? No, he never said <laughs> that. He, he um, has never said that MMR doesn't cause autism. He's never said that vaccines in general don't cause autism because he has this fixed, immutable, science-resistant belief that it's true. But he's recommending now for the Texas outbreak that vaccines can play a role, right? That's the way it started. And then as you read on in the, in the op-ed piece, twice he said, this is a decision about whether or not you should get a vaccine you should make with your physician. And remember that it's a personal decision. Well, you know, which is it? Are you saying that you should you should vaccinate not only to protect yourself, but those around you? Or are you saying it's your choice to catch and transmit a potentially fatal infection during the midst of an outbreak that has already killed one child? Which is it? Yeah, usually you don't say it's your choice. You say vaccination is needed, right, if you're a public health official. And so the, the addition of that is very suspicious. Right. If he was a responsible public health official, first of all, he would go to West Texas. He would he would meet mm -hmm. the family of the child who died. And now there's another uh, man who's died in New Mexico. That's two deaths among roughly 200 now, I think 228 cases. Um, and he would loudly and clearly stand on the soapbox that is provided for him by being Secretary of Health and Human Services and say, get vaccinated, protect your children. It's a sa it's the safest way to protect your children, but he doesn't. Rather, he stands back and talks about personal choice and medical freedom, which is his mantra. He said, one of the things he said in the Fox 
uh, response was that good nutrition is the best defense against infectious disease. Is, is that true, Paul? No. Vaccination is your best defense against an infectious disease that's preventable. I mean, you can have the, the best immune system in the world. You can be healthy and robust and still be felled by, by this virus. I mean, I was living in 1991 in Philadelphia during the Philadelphia measles epidemic when we had 1,400 cases and nine deaths. I think all of those deaths were in, in children who were previously healthy. So I don't know what he's talking about, except that's his thing. I mean, the, the, in his book, uh, The Real Anthony Fauci, he talks about the miasma theory versus the germ theory. And in the miasma theory, as long as you have your good nutrition, as long as you're healthy, then you're not going to be felled by these diseases. Whereas the germ theory believes that specific germs cause specific diseases and preventing them or treating them is life saving. He doesn't really believe that. I think he, he continues to beat the drum for, better nutrition, and he's doing it even now in West Texas. Isn't it true, though, that in um, undernourished countries, measles is more fatal than it is elsewhere? For sure. No, it's true of many infectious diseases. I mean, I you know, was fortunate enough to be work with a team at Children's Hospital to create a rotavirus vaccine. Rotavirus would kill 60 children a year here in the U.S. It would kill 2,000 children a day in the developing world, in large part because of poor nutrition and also uh, less available uh, medical access. But those children who die, uh, those undernourished children who die of measles, a vaccination would have prevented in fact, the disease in the first place, right? Yes, that's why vaccination is your single best way to prevent infection, not nutrition. I mean, which is not to say don't participate in good nutrition, but that's if you think that's going to protect you against this disease, you're wrong. And I think by promoting that, he does harm. It's not like you could snap your fingers and give all of the world good nutrition tomorrow, right? <laughs> it's impossible. Right. That's right. They also said that vitamin A can reduce measles mortality. Is that true? You know, that's interesting. So the Cochrane Collaborative had a review of this, and there were basically eight studies that they reviewed. And they concluded that um, two doses of vitamin A at 200,000 international units per dose, given on consecutive days, could decrease measles mortality. Now, of the eight studies that were reviewed, six were in Africa, one was in England, one was in Japan. The one in England was done in 1932 which is before there were antibiotics or a lot of support systems we have for respiratory diseases. So I'm not sure that was really um, useful. Also, it wasn't a randomized study. So not randomized, published in 1932. The other one was in Japan, which showed no difference in mortality. Even the six uh, studies done in um, Africa, only really two of them clearly showed there was a decrease in mortality. So I think there is an advantage where there is a child who is malnourished and therefore likely vitamin A deficient to mm. benefit from vitamin A therapy. But to say that that also translates to the developed world, I think is wrong, considering that less than 1% or fewer than 1% of children in this country are vitamin A deficient. And so I don't think it really would have much impact here. Plus, he, he talks about cod liver oil. You know, which while it is rich in vitamin A and vitamin D, has about 4,500 international units per teaspoon. So if you're trying to achieve 200,000 international units, you would need <laughs> roughly 45 teaspoons, which I suspect most people aren't going to do. I understand they're shipping cod liver oil and vitamin A to Texas? That's right. And, and I talked to somebody who was on the ground there who actually worked for uh, a news agency. And she said that the pharmacies are just, you know, overwhelmed with people looking for these kinds of treatments, whereas what they should be looking for is a vaccine. Have they set up vaccination centers, for example, like they did after the polio case in upstate New York? I didn't get that impression. I, I would like to think that's true. I don't know. I do know that the, the person who was on the ground there from a news agency said that what she was amazed by was the paucity of signs for measles vaccines. So going back to nutrition, uh, is there any evidence that these children who are dying, it's not just children, it's adults as well, but anyone dying of measles in this Texas outbreak is malnourished? Well, it's certainly true that the child who died of measles was not malnourished. I mean, that, that when, when RFK Jr. said that early on, he said, well, she died because she was malnourished. One of the physicians associated with that case, I guess, said, no, no, she was, she had no risk factors. 
Um, the other person who died was an adult, and and um, they're still trying to adjudicate whether or not that was what he died from. They knew he was unvaccinated. They knew he tested positive for measles post mortem. I think he, I think he he never sought medical care. I think he died without seeking medical care. And the, the thing that's frightening about this is you have basically two deaths among the first now 228 cases. That's a mortality rate of one percent. I mean, the listed mortality rate is closer to 0.1 percent, mm. about one per thousand. So it's much higher, which suggests either one of two things is true or they're both true, which is they're underestimating cases and there's more than they think because these are sort of sequester communities that generally are resistant to outside influence. Or the second thing is that there's just the medical care that's being provided is poor. I mean, these are yeah. rural communities that may not have great medical care. Probably both, as you said. Yeah. What's the rate of uh, asymptomatic infections with measles? Not much asymptomatic infection with measles. I mean, you're asymptomatic before the rash, but uh, asymptomatic infection with measles is pretty rare. I see. So, but nevertheless, with with not enough testing, you could miss a lot of cases. For sure. All right. Uh, he also said tens of thousands died of measles in the 19th century America. Is that correct? I'm not sure how good the data were in 19th century America. Certainly in the early 1900s, it looked there could be six to 9,000 deaths a year from measles. And that, that by the time 1963 rolled around, which is when we had a vaccine, um, the death rate was about 500. So down from thousands to 500. Um, he says that that's because of better sanitation. He says that's because of better nutrition. But if you look at really where the drop occurs, it, it occurred in the 40s because we had something in the 1940s we didn't have before that, which was antibiotics. And although antibiotics don't treat measles per se because it's a virus, antibiotics do treat the bacterial superinfections that occur with measles, such as bacterial pneumonia or sepsis, which can occur associated with measles. So I think that's probably the big, the, the real reason for the drop. But again, he tries to argue it was better nutrition. I wonder if he would be surprised to know that better sanitation actually caused polio epidemics right. around the 1900s. That's right. We should have never done that. that. We should have never improved sanitation. <laughs> <laughs> you can find Paul Offit on Beyond the Noise at Substack. We'll put a link to the column in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.